invite you to stand as we sing this song, the song before the lesson. Number 374, ring out the message. We'll sing all three verses of the song, and then we'll turn our time and attention over to Brother Tyler this morning. Number 374. <clears throat> Well, good morning to each and every one of you. It's good to be with those here at the Laurel Canyon Church of Christ. If you are visiting, I'm very thankful to have you here this Sunday morning. It's an awesome opportunity that we have to worship our God together, to praise Him, to spend some time opening our Bibles together and thinking about Him and about who we are because of Him and what we can be doing to follow Him. Uh, my name, for those who haven't looked at your own billboard or the slides or, man, I've never seen my face more places, I think, <laughs> than ever. But uh, my wife helped me pick out the picture to send to Jamie, so thank you for that, dear. Uh, my name is Tyler Hall. Uh, it is a very pleasure to be here with you all uh, this morning and this week as I bring the gospel meeting during your vacation Bible school. Uh, my two children, Adelaide, age five, and Milo, age three, are with me and my wife, Lee, and we're very thankful to be here. They are excited for VBS, and uh, they'll sit patiently and quietly as Daddy preaches during these times as well. 
Uh, I've been preaching at the West Mason Church of Christ for a little over six years now, and the brethren down there are so encouraging, and uh, we visited here several, several times. We're good friends with the Matthews and several other families, and uh, we love coming up here to Columbus and visit, whether we're passing through or spending some time here, and I'm very thankful for the time I get to spend with you all this week as we talk about evangelism. We started in the adult Bible class here this morning talking about John 4 and how Jesus shows us and how he interacts with a Samaritan woman principles for evangelism, how we are to reach those who are lost and separated from God with the good news that is in Jesus Christ. And so this morning I want us to think about what it means to share the good news. If something good happens to you, how long is it until you tell somebody else about it? How long do you sit on that information? It might be something small, might be something big. We're expecting our third child in October. And so some of that I had to sit on a little bit and wait for the right time until we were both agreed, okay, we're going to tell people. But some people knew a little bit earlier. And now we just tell everybody, obviously. It's hard to hide, but it's wonderful that news of a new life on its way. So when good things happen to you, why do we share them? We have joy and excitement, and we want other people to share in that. And that's just any good news. It can be a promotion at work. It can be, oh, I just had a really good day. They put an onion ring at the bottom of my Burger King french fries, so I got a little bonus there. I don't know why they do that. Little things like that get us excited. So when we're talking about the good news, that's what gospel means, by the way. Good news. We're talking about the good news in Jesus. Where's our excitement? Where's our motivation for sharing? We talked a little bit in our class this morning how sometimes we get in our own way. We start making presumptions. We think somebody's not going to listen because of how we've perceived them or what we think they already might say or do. And I want us to just spend some time this morning looking at three stories, three times in the Bible where people shared their experience about Jesus with other people. And I want us to learn about how this good news is all about God. And he walks with us and shows us how to share it. And he's with us as we share it. And hopefully these accounts help encourage us to do just that, to be sharing the good news. The first point we need to understand is that the good news is by nature meant to be shared. If Jesus came and lived the life that he lived, died the death that he died, and was raised to power by God and ascended back into heaven, and nobody was told about it, what would happen? Nobody would hear the good news. Nobody could believe in the word of Christ. Nobody could be reconciled with God through that powerful message. And so the good news by fundamental nature is meant to be shared. This isn't something that we learn about and then we keep to ourselves. It's meant to be spread. We see this if you turn your Bibles over to Mark chapter 5. There's a story of a man who's possessed not just by a demon, but a legion of demons. For the sake of time, we don't have the uh, space here to read the entire account. But his story is a tragic one. He is isolated from everyone that he knows and loves because the demons just overpower him. People try to chain him up and he breaks free. He cuts himself with stones and he's living among dead bodies in the wilderness because that's the only place for him at this time and in this place. And so Jesus and his disciples come up in a boat, and they encounter this man, and this man is driven by the demons to approach Jesus. They have a conversation. It's pretty interesting. I encourage you to read it. Ultimately, it results in this man having all of those demons driven into a herd of pigs, and the pigs run off a cliff. Exciting. They should make a movie about it. But I want to pick up in verse 15 with you when the news spreads from those pig farmers back to town. In Mark 5 and verse 15 beginning, And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion, sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. 
And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. One thing I want you to notice about this story, and there's a lot that could be said, but Jesus tells this man to do two things. He wants to go with Jesus. And Jesus says, I need you to do something else for me. I want you to go, and I want you to tell. Go home, go to your friends, go to the people that you have a connection with, and tell them what the Lord has done for you. When we open our Bibles, and there is a command there, I want you to notice something. God never gives humans a command that we cannot fulfill. I'm not saying it's not difficult at times. I'm not saying there's not challenges in the way. But God's not going to give us a command that we inherently cannot carry out. And so when he tells us to go and tell, guess what we are able to do? We can go and tell. We can get in our own headspace about it, get anxiety or worried about it. That doesn't mean that's an excuse for not following the commands. And this man, even though he wanted to be with Jesus, he turns around and he joyously proclaims. I mean, you think about that. Jesus tells him, go home to your friends. You know how long it's been since he's even thought about that word, probably? Friends? And now he's able to be reunited with them. And the first thing he's going to tell them, well, the first thing they're going to ask is, what in the world happened to you? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Let me tell you about this one who came up to me and totally changed my life. Now, appreciate this. All of the people he's talking to are marveling, but not all of them are going to believe. We saw that with the crowd. This man was begging to be with Jesus. They were begging Jesus to get out of here. We don't know what happened. All we know is our pigs are dead. Please leave. And so some people just focus on the worldly things. But for this man and for the people who are listening to him, the marvel that comes with seeing God at work. This is the awesome opportunity we have when we're carrying the gospel, that we can share it. Here's what I'm concerned with sometimes, is that we think that evangelism is a spiritual gift for the few. This person over here is really, really good at talking to people, and so they have a gift for evangelism. This lunatic up front preaches full-time, so he must be really good at talking to people. I still get nervous talking in front of people, by the way. But you think, you look at other people and you say, that's their role in the kingdom and that's really good for them. I'm not cut out for evangelism. Brothers and sisters, that is not how this works. Evangelism is not something that you do. It is how you live. And so when we think about this, evangelism is not a spiritual gift for the few, but it is a responsibility for every Christian. Because as we live for Jesus and the world around takes notice, that shining our light is going to lead to opportunities for us to share the gospel. This is one of the points that Peter brings up in 1 Peter chapter 3, 13 through 16. On Monday night, we're going to spend a lot more time in this text. But for this purpose this morning, I just want you to notice how Peter talks about evangelism. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for you a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Notice what he says here. You are always ready to defend your hope. Not just the hope, your hope. Why do you live this way? 
He's not saying if somebody asks you, but when. Because of the way that you live. It's amazing that when we are focused on God and living for him, how doors will open. We need to pay attention that we're looking for those doors and be sure to step through them when they come open. But if we're just focused on God when we're at work or at school, or when we're running our errands, when we're interacting with our neighbors, keeping God in the forefront of our minds, it's amazing what he can do. And we need to be ready to share when somebody takes notice and asks about, why do you live this way? And sometimes we get really caught up, again, for that it's an exclusive thing, or some people are good at evangelism, others are not. I, I learn something new every day. You know, I study the Bible as part of my day job. We should all be studying the scriptures. But I want you to take this to heart. If you knew enough to obey the gospel, to become a Christian, you know enough to tell other people about it. If you knew enough to make a decision for yourself to follow Jesus, you have enough information to share with somebody else to convince them to do the same. Yeah, but what if they ask a question about the origin of the universe? Or what happens if they ask about why we don't use instruments in worship? <laughs> Slow down. Slow down. Those things are important. Those conversations will happen. And you can say, you know what? I would love to study that some more. And that's an opportunity for me to grow and to study those things. But if you knew enough to obey the gospel yourself, you know enough to share it, whether you believe that or not. Let that be convicting to you. And know this, that God does not need your help, but that he wants your help and is asking you to participate. We just have to make sure that we let the gospel display its power and not get in the way of it. This is what I think is so powerful when Paul writes to the church in Corinth. He says this in verse 17 in chapter 1 of this letter. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, yet lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. We just sang about that this morning, the power of the cross. Paul here says that power can be emptied, how? If I get in the way. He uses a word like eloquent, which for some people, is an eloquent word. But he says, I'm not going to try to sound really smart. I don't need to dress up the gospel. I don't need to make it more exciting than it already is. You just share it. Come at it with the wrong motivation sometimes, and I put myself at the head of this line. I need to make sure that I'm not caught up in the excitement of the academic part, rather than just the pure knowledge of truth and love that's found in Jesus Christ. Paul says, you're all getting really caught up in who baptized you. And he said, I might have baptized a few of you, but that's not the main point. I want people to be baptized, but I'm focused on just preaching the word. Introduce them to Jesus. They get to decide what happens next. Preaching Jesus necessarily means talking about baptism and the necessity of it. We have to be so careful not to jump ahead or try to spin it to sound more appealing to one person over another. If the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, just share it and let it do what it does. That leads us to our next point. The good news is ultimately God's work. The gospel is God's plan, and he carries it out in his way. Again, that we have a part to play in that. But if you turn over to John chapter 4, we see that this is all motivated from the heart of God. We had to skip these verses in our Bible class this morning, so I'm glad we get to come back to them now. Jesus has been talking to a Samaritan woman. He's been talking to her about things like drawing water, and that's led to conversations about spiritual thirst and things like relationships and how she's had five different husbands and she's with someone now that's not her husband. And things like worship and family histories. And at the end of all this, she realizes that Jesus is the Messiah, and she runs off to tell people about it. 
And while she's gone off to tell people and to bring them back to him, Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples here in John 4, 34 through 38. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one, soul, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. And so the work is shared. But notice that this stems from Jesus saying, My food, my sustenance, my fuel is to do the will of him who sent me. Jesus is constantly focused on his father and doing what pleases him. And in this case, calling people who are lost back home. Jesus tells them, you just have to open your eyes. We need to see the harvest of souls like Jesus. From a physical standpoint, they were saying, it's yet four months until we start harvesting. And Jesus says, we might do that with our own evangelism efforts. It's not the right time, or maybe a different place. And Jesus says, look around you. Open your eyes. There are souls that are hurting and hungry and thirsty that need me. We need to see the harvest like Jesus, and if we're going to do that, we need his compassion. There's a parallel passage, very similar here, over in Matthew chapter 9, 35 through 38, when again he sees a crowd of people around him waiting to hear from him and learn from him. In Matthew 9 and verse 35 through 38, this is what the Bible says. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. Do you believe that? You say, well, Jesus could say that back in the first century, but today the harvest isn't plentiful. Nobody wants to hear about Jesus. Just check your Google trends, by the way, and you'll know that people are asking and looking about things pertaining to God. But the power here is Jesus saying the, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Can you imagine Peter, James, John, and the others actually praying this? And guess how God is going to answer that prayer? Here's a door, Peter. Walk through it. As you and I are praying to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest, understand that you are an answer to your own prayer a lot of the times. And so we're praying, God, make me a worker Help open my eyes to the harvest around me. Our purpose as God's people isn't to fit in, to find ease, to coast through life or be as comfortable as possible. It is to proclaim his excellencies of him who brought us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. That's our purpose, to tell people the good news that Jesus has reconciled us to our creator, God the Father. And this is God's work. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians 3, if you turn back to that book. He describes himself, Apollos, and others as fellow workers with God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 through 9. He speaks here and says, For one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos. Are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. 
So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. And so he says here, whatever role we're playing in sharing the gospel, it's not about me. It's about God. I'm just playing my part in his work. God has asked us to do the easy part of this, to simply share. Do you know whose job it is to convict hearts, to convict of sin, to awaken hope, to ignite a fire in their soul? <laughs> it's not your job. Bless your heart if you think it is. I used to think that, and it is not my job, and it's so much easier to talk to people about Jesus when you realize that God is active and involved if you are obedient to him. He does the hard work. We are his fellow workers. I love back in John 4, as we talked about in class, that we're just playing a supporting role, just like the woman of Samaria. The people who came out to learn about Jesus, it's, they said there, it's no longer because you told us that we believe in him, but we've come and heard him ourselves, and we're convinced now that he's the savior of the world. That's sharing the good news. Come and see what he's done for me. And when somebody comes, they connect with Jesus. They have the opportunities to submit to him and to follow him. And I might be talking here this morning, and you might be thinking of one or two individuals that you have tried to talk to or you need to try more to talk to. And you say, ah, I, just, I just don't know. There might be too many obstacles in the way. But this is the last point I want to leave you with, and one last story about sharing Jesus. The good news is always relevant. The good news is always relevant. It is always something that can and should be shared. For this story, let's turn to Acts chapter 8. We won't read 4 through 8, but Acts 8, 4 through 8 gives some background on Philip. He's been preaching in cities of Samaria. He's been doing miracles, healing people from unclean spirits. And there's much joy in this city of Samaria. So he's been talking to a lot of people. He's been spreading the gospel. You have a little uh, story here, an account of Simon the sorcerer with Peter coming on the scene. But then we pick up with Philip in verse 26. That's why I wanted you to realize in verses 4 through 8, Philip's been preaching to crowds in the city. And now God's going to tell him to change his strategy a bit. Picking up in verse 26 of Acts 8. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was, re uh, was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shears is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. There's a lot that can be said about this story, and much has been said. Notice that God, through the Spirit, is telling Philip to go. This angel of the Lord says, here's the place. You are going to leave this populous city with lots of people, and you are going to go to a desert road in the hottest part of the day when nobody in their right mind will be out there. Sounds kind of similar to when Jesus was by the well. 
in John chapter 4. Everybody else had gotten their water earlier, but one woman came late. I want you to notice from this story of Philip in this Ethiopian that the gospel is relevant anywhere. Whether you're in a crowded space with lots of different people, or whether you just run into one other person in a desert place, spiritually speaking, even in the most unlikeliest of circumstances, God can and does work if you're ready to obey him. Just like Philip, he arose and went. Didn't ask questions. He just did it. The gospel is relevant anywhere, and the gospel is relevant at any time. You know why Philip was in Samaria? Why he wasn't in Jerusalem? So one of his brothers in Christ was just martyred. Because people had scattered out of Jerusalem because he was killed for preaching Jesus. This is like the time that most of us would say, let's lay low for a while. Let's, let's just keep this hush-hush and wait for a more opportune time to talk about Jesus. Philip's not doing that, brothers and sisters. He's telling the crowds in the city of Samaria, and he's telling this one on his way home from worshiping in Jerusalem. In the wake of persecution is the time God picks to spread the gospel. The gospel, the good news, is always relevant anywhere and anytime and with anyone. I wasn't there to witness it, but I'm going to take an educated guess and say that this Ethiopian and that the Jew Philip did not look the same. They very likely did not have the same skin color. They very likely were raised in very different settings. They had different social backgrounds. They had different education. There was a different wealth status between the two of them. Why do they have any business talking to each other? What is it that you're reading? Do you understand that? How can I if somebody doesn't come alongside to teach me and guides me? We are so good at seeing the walls of the world. And the gospel is a sledgehammer. And it can knock down those walls if we just share it. With anyone, no matter how different or similar they might be to me. The gospel is for all. And we need to make sure that our personal biases are laid at the foot of the cross. And die with the old self so that we can share the gospel with everyone that we meet. Two more things I want you to notice from Philip, and then I'll let the lesson be yours to decide what you do with it. Notice how Philip met this man where he was. He, he approached him in his chariot. He asked him where he was in Scripture. He didn't jump to a new place in the Old Testament. It says there, in verse 34, when he's saying, I ask you, does this... He had a question about this text. Who is the prophet talking about? And then verse 35, he opened his mouth and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. I even love the posture that you can put in your mind that Philip got up into the chariot and sat down next to him. He's not in front of him saying, this is what you need to know. And I stand up here in front of you as somebody saying, this is what you need to know. But when we're talking to people in day-to-day -day life, come alongside them, sit next to them, and open God's word and look at it together as equals. You might know it a little bit better than them, but you need it just as badly. I need it just as badly. Start where they are, while you come alongside people who need to hear the good news. And this last one steps on my toes, and I know it's going to step on some others. Open your mouth. In verse 35, again, Philip opened his mouth. 
<laughs> what if Philip just said, oh, it's talking about somebody else? I answered your question. Next. Got any other questions? <laughs> he saw an opportunity to talk about Jesus, and he jumped on it. Sometimes I think the devil convinces Christians that if we are just really, really, really nice to people, that they'll learn about Jesus. St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel always, and if necessary, use words. I'm here to tell you this morning from God's own word, it's necessary to use words. Don't get me wrong. Your deeds and the way that you live will absolutely shine a light. But at some point, brothers and sisters, we must open our mouths and confess Jesus to the world around us. You do not make disciples of the kingdom just by being nice to people. We have to confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and that there is salvation in no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Acts 4 and verse 12. We need to open our mouths just like Philip did and do it with all the love and gentleness that we can. We're going to talk a lot about how we do that this week. And I pray that you can come back at every opportunity that you can because this is ultimately what we're dealing with. Jesus gave his marching orders to his apostles at the end of the Gospel of Matthew when he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus has all the authority. So if he says something, we're expected to listen and follow. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The good news is meant to be shared. The good news is God's work. And the good news is always relevant. It was relevant in the first century, and it's relevant in Columbus, Ohio in 2023. So let's live like it. Let's talk like it. Let's serve other people like it is the best news that we have ever had enter into our lives. We've been talking about the good news this morning, but I want to ask you, is the good news your good news? It's all about whether you've done anything with it or not. We can hear good news and do nothing with it. And when it's the gospel of Jesus, there's a demand to choose. This morning, you can do exactly as the Ethiopian eunuch did. After Philip opened his mouth and beginning with that scripture, he preached to him Jesus. And as they were going along, they stopped. And the eunuch said, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? If you believe, you may. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They stopped the chariot. He takes him down into the water. He's baptized. And he is added into the body of Christ. And there is rejoicing in heaven. And there's rejoicing as this eunuch goes along his way. You can do the exact same thing this morning if you have not, to obey the gospel, to believe in Jesus, confess him as the Messiah and the Savior of the world, to repent of your sins and turn to him with your whole heart and your whole mind, to be baptized into his death so you can be raised in his resurrection to newness of life and to walk faithfully and to share this good news with everyone that you meet. And if you just need prayers or encouragement, now's a time for you as well. If you struggle with sharing your faith or being convinced of your faith for yourself. Again, we can pray for you, encourage you. This time is for you to reflect. As we sing this song, understand that Jesus does save, but he's not going to force you if you don't want to be saved. Do you understand your condition before God this morning? Do you understand that you need Jesus? And if there's anything that we can do to help you with that, to help you obey the gospel, to walk in the way of love and light. Let us know, and I'll be up here for in the front while we're singing, and you can come forward and let me know. Let's stand and praise God together.